This is The Michael Bryan Show. Hi everyone, welcome back to the show and today I'm joined with Ludmila Schaefer who is a doctor, she is a medical oncologist and she also helps people outside of that in the personal development space as well. Ludmila, thanks for joining me. Uh, thank you very much Michael for having me. So I'd be really curious to know how technology is aiding healthcare. I know a lot of stories about technology taking jobs, that sort of thing. Well, talk to us a bit about how that isn't necessarily the case and how technology is actually helping the system and helping healthcare. Well, Michael, uh, right now, technology really revolutionary and uh, it is only going to advance. And I would say when we start, I would like to give two examples. Let's say one, um, if uh, you're in a medical facility, clinic, hospital, anywhere, and uh, you are seeing. um Mr. Johnson, patient A, for example, and it would be 45-year-old, and uh, that person actually was offered to be seen by artificial intelligence doctor or human doctor. So there would be an option, AI doctor or human doctor. So then um, the person, one patient, uh, picked up artificial intelligence, sort of technology doctor, and was given a device machine, and with few clicks, basically, it began consultation. So there was obtained history, physical treatment plan, and pretty much within the minutes, the whole database came, the algorithm came, and uh, provided diagnosis, future tests, plan of care, and that uh, person A that seen artificial intelligence doctor was actually impressed by efficiency, precision, and really uh, finish all and knew all information, but continued to stay very lonely in the room and accept communication with device. There was no really interaction. There was still a lot of sort of questions. Okay, what's next? What's next? Versus another person was offered and he chose to see a human doctor, you know, just like me, for example, medical oncologist. And um, this is an old school, what we call, or maybe uh, prefer personal interaction. So during this time, we not only discuss plan, uh, we did physical exam, making notes and uh, show really empathetic response. So as we can tell, Michael, in one situation, we got very fast, very efficient data. But in another situation, we not only got a data physical exam, but we also got this ethical concern so or ethical uh, communication. So I would say probably at this situation, what we can tell, it's not like one replacing another, but it actually combined both together in one harmony. That's where we would be looking for technology moving forward rather than replacing, but rather combine both together. So would you say that that actually increases the quality or the speed or maybe they'll see something that the human might not be able to see, maybe because of pattern recognition or whatever the case is? Have you had attempts at this yourself and have noticed any differences? There are some information would be much uh, faster and obviously that would depend only on the setting. As we know that a lot of technology divided into different subtypes. So some of it, it would be through what's called natural language processing. We are communicating through writing and speaking. And on the other hand, we also have uh, machines, let's say like robots, or we have a different robotics, um, for example, like um, automated machines driving in the car or the cars that drive in, you know, by themselves. So in this situation, what I have seen that the, we have to understand what situation we apply and what type of technology. Is it the machine learning? Is it robotic? Or it's more what's called natural language processing. So how does that actually improve things? I imagine it will analyze the patient in front of them and determine what they're feeling analyze kind of micro expressions that sort of thing what kinds of things are they actually picking up on that a person maybe wouldn't 
there is some advantage and disadvantage. Advantage that, for example, some repetitive task or automated, like patients get, for example, appointment, maybe more um, precise, and they don't have to sit and wait on the phone when someone answers a phone call, or there might be tests uh, coming back faster results, such as the radiology reports, or there might be faster um, obtained data and statistics. And sometimes we hear in the clinic that their people would be getting much faster and more accurate data from an artificial intelligence device or from the computer rather than from the doctor. But then on the other hand, what we see that, you know, things like physical exam, it is very difficult for robot to do such a precise, you know, touch uh, or uh, things like express um, empathy or holding hands. So that's where we see advantage and disadvantage. So rather than replacing, I would say we kind of combine both together to perform those tasks. Do you find that the the outcome is different? Would you say it's a better outcome using technology and AI? Does it affect the treatment that patients will get? Like, talk to us a bit about what the effects are for the, the patient as well. It is not a better or worse. I would say it's a probably a different aspect. And in some situation, it actually enhanced approach and enhanced treatment. Like, for example, in the past, a lot of things has been done manual. For example, someone goes... Uh, get the biopsy, and that biopsy takes uh, several days. We do what's called special stain when we identify, for example, what type of um, tissue it is, or if it's in situation of the cancer, where it's cancer coming from. So right now, it's a lot incorporated technology. And if in the past, we just were able to know what type of cells and uh, uh, what type of pathology right now we get such precise, accurate, what's called a molecular profile. It's a special biomarkers that it's uh, pretty much we're looking forward instantly to find out that what type of biomarkers, uh, find out what the best treatment. And we have a new medication target those specific biomarkers. However, it's not just only machine helps to match that biomarker with the treatment plan, which we can get much faster in nowadays, but also that's where the human doctor, what I call coming up and describing, okay, we need to take in consideration what are the medical problems we have? You know, what's the social situation? What's the financial situation? So it's a lot of different aspects. So I would say it enhanced how we take care of the patients in nowadays or even obtain information, for example, fast um, um, articles or data so we can get multiple articles and multiple information instantly, which is for human doctor very difficult to remember, for example, 100 different, different articles at the same time <laughs> of different numbers. So I'm looking kind of mostly at enhanced care. You have, a, have to, I wouldn't say persuade, but let's say you've got patients that are leaning towards the human consultant or care provider even though the AI is sophisticated enough that it could probably help aid the process and get to the conclusion faster, let's say. How do you talk to patients about this and utilizing this? Because some people don't even know that AI is already here and already being used in this way. So for someone that's fairly new to the technology, all of a sudden, you're using AI to help diagnose their cancer or come up with treatment plans, that can be quite stressful and probably confusing for patients. So how do you help them with that? How do you help them overcome that kind of barrier with it? Actually, Michael, that's exactly what I want to emphasize because of what you are doing. It's really helping the community by looking when we see the patient and um, a lot of times we think very concrete. So we think, okay, 
someone uh, com communicate about AI, artificial intelligence, and they tell that I'm afraid of it. I'm absolutely against it. And there is a huge risk. But there, there are others that absolutely dive in. So I would say that what you are doing, bringing this awareness, it really helps because we should not be looking at technology, robotics, artificial intelligence as concrete. You know, here I'm afraid, here is the risk, here is the help, but rather uh, identify in a specific organization, in specific situation and start line up. Let's say this part of information would be better obtained from AI. This part of information or communication would be done with human doctor. This repetitive task maybe could be done through robotics. So I would say everyone who is listening, rather look at the big picture and identify within your organization, within your company, uh, where exactly those pockets where we can incorporate and learn rather than just take concrete and uh, sort of black and white. I guess that is the the real key, isn't it? It's not being able to look at things as either or, but the possibility of using all of it, using the whole package, the whole system to benefit the person. I guess that's how they have to reconcile it, I guess, in their own head of, look, we are going to be using technology more and more it is going to enhance it. It is going to give you better results in a faster way. You're spending less time waiting, not a lot of waiting around for information, data, waiting for test results, that sort of thing. You can have it happen in minutes when it would probably take us months to collate all the information together and compare it with like samples to come up with some kind of similar pattern is what they're hoping for, hopefully. Otherwise, if it's all new and all brand new, the patient has no idea what's happening or how it's going to go. At least having some level of predictability will likely give them some comfort as well. So it's becoming more and more needed in a way. Technology is more needed now than ever because, I mean, over here in the UK, we're constantly being told about how stretched the NHS is. And in America, it's so expensive to get the health care that they get that this might even bring costs down for them so technology is potentially going to revolutionize the the entire world healthcare system uh that's correct and uh, i always bring my quote that i've been saying that the future healthcare isn't man versus machine it's a man and machine together in a symphony of healing <laughs> Are there any new things that have come about since the technology has started to be used in oncology and diagnosing and treatments of cancer? Is there anything that specifically happened as a result? Maybe a brand new drug has been developed, maybe a version of a treatment plan that hasn't really been tested before has come out with somebody and it's worked, let's say. What's happened since technology has started to be implemented? So overall, uh, from the main uh, uh, perspective, there are a lot of different new biomarkers. Uh, we also have what it's called next generation sequence. When we identify what we call different receptors, molecular alteration, transformation, and then design specific drugs. We do know that it's right now so many companies designing what's called um, antibody drug conjugates. What it means that we have that antibody that everybody knows that we develop antibody, and then we have that specific targeted uh, drug. And then that specific targeted drug actually has a linker. It's kind of like almost a chain, like a connection. So then this antibody deliver that drug specifically to the targeted tissue. So design technology like this, um, it also very much changing outcome and probably even replacing chemotherapy, but time will show. 
uh, with um, what we see obviously in oncology because of the new biomarkers. So we try to identify faster and find clinical trials. But I can tell you, Michael, all of this, it's still in neonatal stage. And when it comes to a real patient, and I want to make sure that everyone who is listening in the audience, none of it can be done pure through machines. We still need human intellectual thinking and the specific detail information to finalize the treatment plan, result, test, and so on. But there are some repetitive tasks and data definitely makes a huge advancement. So where do you go from these kinds of treatments and using technology how did you transition from that to organic bravery then because it seems like you're approaching things in a very different way uh yes organic bravery um it is a very special network so bravery overall we all know that it's uh, uh just defined as a quality of state having courage however there is a technology uh, what I coined, it's called organic bravery, and it has been uh, patented and uh, approved by uh, USPTO. It's a dynamic framework that actually awaken personal, emotional, and professional actions in the field of decision making. So what it means that each of us has some inner response or genetic predisposition. You know, we all phenotypically look different, we think different, and there is somewhere we have what's called epigenetics. And those epigenetics, something that we de could develop over a period of time. Um, the Gleb Shumatsky discovered a gene, it's called statmin, uh, located in the amygdala of the brain that uh, kind of responsible for emotions. So a lot of times, if we make specific tasks and uh, do specific decisions, then we could actually activate those specific, what we call epigenetics, and that could help us potentially improve um, decisions, uh, capacity in certain unexpected situations. So it's not, Michael, just about big heroic act, but it actually everyday decisions that shape our life. It manifests in all life aspects. It basically kind of tapping in our inherent courage to positively impact the world. And uh, we have several uh, pillars as well, such as personal, emotional, professional, improved relationship and uh, positive impact. It seems like it's more of a personal development framework, which is that so different from the work that you're doing with oncology patients? Because I imagine they'd have to be courageous and, and brave in, in some respects. So did you ever try or attempt to use this framework with your patients as well? I would say the very first uh, how it's organic bravery was born, it's in the clinical setting because our patients making those decisions very instant. So all of this is very intertwined with our decisions. Many times we have to make decision when it's unexpected situation comes. Let's say someone get ill or maybe car accident or certain trauma, or maybe someone getting ready for Olympics and um, you know playing sports. So it's a lot of times those decisions, even in um, uh, um, sports such as, you know, football or soccer or any other sports, we kind of have to, during that specific time, make specific decision, right? So that's where organic bravery. So we definitely see that um, that organic bravery incorporated. We don't call that specific terminology as scientifically. However, that specific network encouraging patients, communicating, and also managing different aspects of life, not just treatment, not only diagnostic test, but also what's the short-term goal and long-term goal, realistic goal and unrealistic goal. So that's something um, we see, um, I would say, every day um, in clinic. 
what tends to make the biggest difference then if we're talking health relationships courage personal professional what tends to move the needle the most is there anything in particular that you can think of when it comes to that like what makes the biggest difference the biggest the difference makes when people incorporate organic bravery or specific decision in a certain situation when we intertwine and connect our passion and expertise and experience. What I see that it's a lot of times we have to make certain decisions based on our work schedule or uh, things that we have to do for the family or maybe other responsibility we have. And uh, many people, they really dive in and let's say, especially in uh, America, you know, it's a long hours of work. And I know it's in UK, it's in many countries, you know, we have this long hours of work and uh, we get, let's say, seven to 14 days vacation. And uh, I don't know what it's in other countries, but I heard this probably some countries even less than that. So there is no really time for that personal um, development or maybe something that we passionate about. What moves the needle when people incorporate what they are passionate about, for example, someone likes hiking or you know exercise or maybe interested in art or music or singing, something like that. When we incorporate that specific interest and uh, into our work schedule and kind of intertwine, that is what exactly moves the needle. That what helps people to become more brave because then the interest rises as well as productivity rises. So that's exactly what I believe and uh, help people exactly with that um, professional development and uh, intertwine with personal interests. What else tends to increase productivity? Because I know that a lot of people are trying to get the most out of every single minute and hour as well. So if they're able to be passionate, I imagine that having a big impact on how much they get done, whether they'll push through, whether they'll keep going, even when they would otherwise stop and say they weren't passionate about the thing or they weren't, they wasn't interested at all. They're more likely to stop and to quit and to not, not finish the task at hand. What other things would you say are important when it comes to being productive? So the other things that it's a, a team. So develop that team and surround yourself with uh, people that actually have similar interests. So we always say you surround yourself with five people you want to be like. And that probably also helps to um, complete the task. Because absolutely, we all can, you know, carry on in our passion and never finish what we're supposed to do. But that's exactly develop that, you know, specific bravery when we specifically learn how to combine personal growth that actually encourages you to step either out of your comfort zone or know exactly time when to uh, stop, you know, doing your hobby or, you know, let's say playing music and complete the task. So that's exactly to identify time frame, develop specific um, uh, team around you and um, kind of helps uh, to identify how we can, you know, combine, how we can create that bad schedule for ourselves. And of course, it requires, Michael, also emotional resilience and emotional resilience obviously we all face in you know challenges and obstacles every day so in that specific difficult situation on when it's required to complete specific task um, that's where we incorporate what I call emotional resilience what techniques or prompts do you think that other people can utilize to be more resilient because it can be quite easy to think long term 
can be quite easy to think medium term, but then the idea of waking up and getting out of bed every single day when you're going through something that's difficult, that can sometimes be the hardest thing to do. Uh, getting up every day and working towards something, no matter how hard it is, how can you help someone every day to get through all of that? Because just understanding that it's going to be tough sometimes, if the tough never really feels like it's going to go away, like it always feels like it's going to be tough when you're doing this every day, help someone in that state get through it mentally. Because some people might be in that situation and they don't have the questions or the prompts or the exercises or the techniques to help them day to day. Absolutely, Michael. And uh, one thing that uh, I agree that some people able to get up and go and move and do things absolutely stay on task and some just have a difficult time and uh, many times we hear right now a phrase that I absolutely disagree which people call if I could do it you could do it I absolutely disagree with this because we all (laughs) have different genetic predisposition we all have come from different families we have different way how our you know genetic response works so saying something that if i could do it you could do it i truly believe it's completely completely wrong so w- the main technique i would say that's exactly where we come into personalized uh, change into personalized approach like for example let me ask you, Michael, when you, when I tell word um, Apple, what do you think? I actually have Apple devices and I like how sleek they are. I, I like how helpful they are and how simple they are. So when I think of Apple, I think stylish and simple. Exactly. So that means automatically, instantly comes that device that's sleek, nice. So we, that's called proprietary brand. What about when we say, let's say name Michael or me like Ludmilla, you know, what do you think? So every time we have to make sure we identify something for us. So then not only we associate with uh, things that how we can do things, but also people surround us understand and appreciate how we look so it's kind of what i call almost develop your own proprietary brand and that your personal proprietary brand actually helps to navigate how you develop that schedule so let's say if one person cannot get up in the morning there will be you know one approach maybe one would be better doing journaling another person maybe have a coach another person maybe you know have alarm and uh, somebody else you know maybe just uh, like to be a loner and do everything on task and absolutely don't like to be disturbed so that's exactly where we uh, come in and uh, particularly in my situation I also help people with these innovative methods to personalize their own schedule, they pass in a way that not only helps how to better navigate through the day, through the trauma, through professional development, but also amplify personal legacy and also increase fulfillment and in many situations that enhance career or puts in a much better emotional stability. Do you use AI and technology with organic bravery as well? Or is this something that you're implementing within that framework as well? Absolutely. The uh, tasks that we can do in terms of uh, repetitive and the checking things like assessment and identify those uh, specific response through AI. Like, for example, we do know if in a chatbot, for example, we put certain data and that data, we have input and then we just have output. Now, how is everything happen in the middle? We don't really know. 
So we don't know exactly the deep neural network. We know what we put in and we know what we got out. However, so in uh, business and in organic bravery, we use artificial intelligence. So there are some repetitive tasks that we could do and identify certain score where you are on the ladder, what exactly things you would need in life. But then obviously after we receive that results, that's where it requires still human interaction and sort of to take to the next level. So yes, absolutely, we are using artificial intelligence. I wonder if the results will actually be different with technology versus without. Do you ever test that as like a quality control? Do you ever go in and say, right, let's test using AI and not using AI and seeing what the difference is? So with the technology and without technology, it depends on the tasks. So if we use what's called natural language process, then it would be definitely more helpful with technology. For example, certain ideas or certain way to ask a question. Yes, it absolutely, or receive some data of a statistical analysis. However, in a different, this is obviously make faster. So right now we are more efficient by using technology, by using machine learning algorithms, So that is much faster, more efficient, and that actually will create also new jobs. I know it's a lot of people worry about, you know, will I be replaced by AI? And uh, I start smile because we, there will be maybe some jobs that will be eliminated, and but there also will be created a new jobs, like you know, for example. Uh, right now when we have a social media analyst or someone that, uh, you know, influencer, you know, 30 years ago when I started practicing medicine, we haven't even heard about this. So right now, a lot of those repetitive tasks. So it saves time. It makes things more efficient. It creates jobs. On the other hand, some of the things will be eliminated and that's exactly beauty where we combine uh, technology with the uh, human work. Well, I'm very curious and interested to see what the future may hold, especially when it comes to your medical practice and then organic bravery outside of that. Do you think it's a, a positive thing? Do you think it's going to go well in the future? Do you think it's not? Loads of people are worried about, you know, Terminator, Skynet robots taking over some people don't like it some people think the ai is going to get rid of us all essentially do do you think that is likely or do you think it's not do you think it's a positive future that we're in for or a negative one Uh, i think it has both aspects because we do worry about ethical concerns Uh, there could be breach of technology cyber security how exactly we Uh, communicate, especially in the medical world. Let's say if someone gets certain data and, um, you know, what about if any error from robotics or technology reading CT scan or doing a surgery, for example, how about an attorney? You know, nobody will be having litigation against artificial intelligence, right? But that would be rather taken against doctor. So it's those concerns are very real. And uh, I think only all of us together, if we identify those steps and pockets where it's applicable and where it's not applicable, but I would say it's absolutely the worries is real and the ethics uh, needs to be considered, especially in terms of the litigation and law. Uh, but on the other hand, for example, like in our situation, when we practice, we definitely see that Um, it is right now a huge shortage of physicians. And I don't know if it's in UK, is it also shortage or you don't have it? I think it kind of depends because there probably is a shortage, but how it shows up for us is long waiting times. So it could be taking months before you get 
what you really need versus if there wasn't a shortage, I imagine the waiting list and the waiting time would be radically reduced. Like you wouldn't have to wait that long. So it probably is, but I think it shows up as long waiting times and taking a long time to get the treatment that you need. So yeah, talk to us a bit about how technology can change those things. And uh, that's exactly where we're looking. For example, maybe some of those educational materials or schedule for immediate tests, um, like we know uh, breast cancer mammograms or colon cancer, especially it's on the rise, or population younger than uh, 50 years old. And right now, the recent article has been published, overall cancer risk rising in the young population, especially under 50 years old. So maybe some automated scheduling or uh, describe about symptoms or educational material, because this is true um, that, for example, American Hospital Association estimates that the industry will face a shortage up to 124,000 physicians in 2033. So we ask, so who will treat and diagnose the population? Yeah. So that's where we really have to create that disruptive solution and in, incorporate, for example, virtual assistant in the form of AI that maybe will schedule initial consultation or follow-up or notify about normal, abnormal colonoscopy, mammogram, because a lot of times patients complain, no one called me. <laughs> and uh, in this situation, you know, there could be increased patient satisfaction, safety, maybe quality control. So that's exactly where we stand in. Well, it sounds like it's in the positive frame of mind. And I, I also... Uh... I am actually excited for the future of it because I think there will be a degree of like a limit where humans can't possibly achieve the results that we would like. So whether the expectation goes up, whether the standard of care might drop to the point where technology might actually be better than humans because they're being stretched too thin, they're too stressed out, they're seeing too many patients technology can help with the quality of all of that and I do hope that it's adopted in a more effective way as well like I hope we are not going to slow technology down because we are afraid of it as opposed to letting technology do its thing give it some rules and principles to stick to so that it doesn't harm anybody and just monitor it just see how it goes and just rein it in if it needs it, push it forward if it needs it. But I don't think we should hold back progress because of how we feel about the technology, about how we feel about using AI to to benefit all of us. And I really do think that it can, but I, I also think that sometimes you've got the opposites happening. So you get people that wanted to push as far out as we can take it and damn the consequences essentially and then you've got people on the opposite end that don't like the place we're in now never mind five ten years from now when it's running absolutely everything so sometimes you get the people that are in opposite camps and then you get the people in the middle that are just kind of thinking well let's just see how it goes and just see where it takes us and I, I do think that it will be in a positive way. I, I do think that it will change things for the better. Absolutely. And that's why I'm, uh, Michael, bringing that concept. Um, I call the other side. Um, in fact, uh, I wrote a book. It's called uh, The Other Side of Oncology. And I believe that this is not just the other side of oncology. It could be the other side of AI, the other side of any business industry and company things that we actually don't see right now, that we don't implement today right now. So I call it, we look at the other side and identify so then we all can have a positive impact from AI and development. Well, I would like to give the people listening the chance to connect with you, possibly read the book, find out more about the work that you're up to. How can, we, how can people do that? So it could be websites, social media. How can people find out more? Uh, Michael, please uh, connect with me at uh, www.thedoctorconnect.com or send email 
info at thedoctorconnect.com. And also we have a book coming up. It's called uh, Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. It's a compilation of stories of 15 physicians about 15 plus disciplines in incorporation AI and uh, as well as the other side of oncology. And please connect with me on social media. And thank you so much, Michael, for such a valuable questions and insightful conversation. Thanks so much for being a guest on the show. Those that are listening, feel free to subscribe, share the show, tell others, and also leave a review wherever you are listening in to your podcast. Ludmila, it's been great. I look forward to keeping in touch. And yeah, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Michael. Likewise.